Um, in this panel, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we've, our first two panels have been more general, um, one dealing with, with craft, mostly, and one dealing with uh, diver diversity in science fiction fantasy. Uh, this one's going to be dealing more with um, the works of our two authors, uh, but we will not be getting into uh, any kind of spoilery territory. Uh, the thought being that um, there will probably be people here who are fans of one or the other, and we'd like everyone to come out being fans of both and to go out and buy the other's books. And, and so we're, we're not going to spoil uh, um, Kelly's books for Walter's fans and vice versa. So, so that's that's a reason for that policy. The butler did it. <laughs> the detective did it. Jeez. I did it. Who <laughs> <laughs> did it? Who <laughs> <Who's laughs> <it? laughs> <laughs> 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 is in your name? Not in my you name. Tell this is the last panel of the convention. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Right from the get-go. Yes. Uh, we're we're all a little tired, uh, but but we will persevere. And, and we will win. I'm going to start with alternating questions. Um, if if any one of you has an interesting comment about a question to the other one, feel feel free to add it when uh, the person to whom the question was uh, uh, asked is done. Uh, I'll start with you, Walter. Um, in the 80s, uh, back in that in that wonderful time of which people remember so fondly. Uh, you were a part of the cyberpunk movement, you know, certainly to, to an extent. Uh, I'd, like, I'd be very interested in hearing to what extent, because you've certainly written cyberpunk. Well, I, I certainly, hello, Can you, is this working? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, yes, I certainly did, and I certainly was. Uh, I, you know, there weren't, it wasn't like an organization that you could join, you didn't get a membership card, you didn't get a certificate you could put on your wall. Bruce Sterling didn't give you a secret handshake? Uh, no, no, he didn't. Well, he's, he, there may be a secret handshake, but nobody showed it to me. Then it, pro then it probably doesn't exist. Uh, you know, I was, I was writing, I was writing in a degree of isolation. Uh, you know, I certainly knew Bruce. I knew Lou Shiner was my principal contact. Uh, but uh, um, you know, the term cyberpunk was something that came up after I finished my first cyberpunk novel. Uh, you know, I gave it to my editor, and she said, they're going to call you a cyberpunk, and I said, is that good? And she didn't have an answer for that. <laughs> Turns out kind of, yeah. Yeah, kind of. Tur turned out to be very good in retrospect. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, and uh, that book was Hardwired, which is just out here yes. uh, this weekend. Launch, uh, launched, launched, uh, joined the bomb. Just, just launched. Uh, and it's been my most popular book over the years, uh, but I recently um, had to re-edit it, uh, and I went back and I looked at uh, all of the uh, original reviews uh, from when it was published, and half of them were extremely, angrily, insanely negative. That, that this, this book was not just disliked, but it was hated. <laughs> Why? With an incredible passion. Uh, and the other half loved it. Um, and I, I think uh, cyberpunk was was pretty polarizing when it came out, and uh, and some of the authors were pretty polarizing. Uh, uh, Bruce Sterling felt that the way that you created a literary movement was you had to define it by working out who your enemies were. <laughs> and it turns out, David Brin. Uh, well, David Brent was very happy about it, actually, because then he could promote himself as the anti-cyberpunk, uh, and and it was just a promotional gimmick for him. So, um, yes. Anyway, uh, so th so that's where that was, and and cyberpunk eventually evolved. I'm I'm still as much a cyberpunk as I ever was. Uh, but the subject matter and the sort of breadth of my work has changed. Um, I, I think that the, the primary lessons of the cyberpunk uh, writers were not um, you know, urban dystopias, no. but rather the way that you looked at the future and the realization that the future was going to be uh, multicultural uh, rather than you know, a single culture spreading throughout space. Yeah, certainly um, if, if you look at the Bruce Dillon Swarm, 
that which was a cyberpunk story had none of the characteristics yes. that the people have ascribed to it. Uh, yeah, um, and and the other realization was of how technology was going to be used by different elements of society. Um, so I've carried that forward in everything I've written since. Uh, you know, even though it might not appear to the to the casual observer to be in any way cyberpunk. It's still in the bones of the work. Yes. It's in the way I think about the future. Mm -hmm. Any comment, Kelly, on cyberpunk? <laughs> no is a perfectly legitimate answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, Kelly was born long after this. <laughs> Um, Kelly, you've written uh, both YA and adult novels set in the same world. Um, how do you handle the differences? How, how do fans react to it? Uh, how, how do you differentiate when, when you're writing, when you're thinking about it? Uh, the reason for doing both in the same world is it made it really, really easy. I didn't have to rebuild the world. So um, I wrote YA, as I said, I think at this con at some point, because my daughter got to be about 12, 13 and started eyeing Bitten on my shelf and saying, when can I read that? Like, not for a while. Uh, so it was writing something with the same types of characters, but teenagers set in the same universe. So really, uh, writing YA for me was in that same world. Part of it too was there were others like my daughter who started reading Bitten when they were young. So this gave me an impetus to write something that, that was more age appropriate. The problem with that was that I really timed those YA novels well which means I didn't time them at all. It was entirely for my daughter, but the timing was perfect. The first novel came out a month after the Twilight Saga ended, <laughs> which meant that there was this massive teen audience looking for paranormal fiction. Mine doesn't have any um, vampires in those, uh, those books, but it, it didn't matter. They were perfectly happy to read some, something with different paranormal in it which meant that that very quickly became my best-selling series. Continues to be, my YA continues to outsell my adult, which then means that now I get the problem of actually having more 11 and 12 year olds reading Bitten because they came into my YA fiction and then see what else I've got out there. <coughs> to the point where I hear you know, that in some stores, because I'm better known as a YA writer, they shelve Bitten on the YA, sh on the YA shelf. There's one bookseller who told me this story of a very bright teen who was in the store with uh, her mother, went to the adult shelf, got bitten, put it on the teen shelf, brought her mother over, and said, Kelly Armstrong has a new teen book out. Look! <laughs> you know what? Someone smart enough to do that deserves to read an adult book. I think they're old enough to read that. But you know, yes, so those audiences have been very similar. It was very interesting because I expected that I was writing for two separate audiences, adult and teen. And they really did blend a lot. A lot of adults read the teen books because so many adults read Twilight. And then there was this weird phenomenon where they read my YA books and then read my adult books and said, these are more for me because they had come from reading YA Paranormal and uh, read, them, read, them, read them up. So the audience was very similar and there was a lot more crossover than I ever expected. Walter, any comment on YA uh, versus adult? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Excellent. Um, I do have a follow-up. Um, I spoke to Shauna McGuire and I asked her why she writes uh, under two names. And she says, uh, my, my uh, Shauna books are meant for an audience that starts with age about 16, 17, who are people who for the most part I would not want reading my mirror books. Uh, and, and that's why, and also she, there's also the, the issue of being not taken seriously enough as a science fiction writer 
because she writes uh, paranormal. Um, did you think about using a pseudonym? At the time, no, because we really weren't expecting that crossover. This would have been, when I sold those books, it would have been 2006. So Twilight was really just starting to catch on, and we weren't seeing those massive adult audiences reading that. So we really thought it was two separate audiences. However, I also write middle grade now, which were written for my sons. Um, and those are written as K.L. Armstrong, because I learned my lesson. I may, I may be a little uh, uneasy with 12, 13 year olds reading Bitten. I really don't want nine year olds reading <laughs> That makes perfect sense. Um, Walter, um, you're a gamer and, and you've written games. Uh, I'm interested uh, in thinking, in, in, in knowing about how your experience as a gamer has influenced you as a writer and how uh, writing games has influenced you as a writer, as, as a writer of novels and stories. Um, I tend to create games based on the stuff that I'm not going to write about. Okay. But I have the ideas anyway. Uh, but it's it's not the sort of thing that I write um, easily. So uh, when I'm when I'm thinking in other genres, I tend to make a game out of it. And and a, only a very small percentage of my games have actually been published. Uh, most of them are just uh, created for the amusement of my local gaming group. Um, so, for instance, I, I had a, a lengthy uh, game um, uh, campaign that uh, involved, uh, the, the characters were all police detectives in New York City. And there was no science fiction element at all, or fantasy element. It was a very realistic uh, police procedural game. Um, I did a, a game for many years set in the late Roman Republic. And once again, no science fiction or fantasy element at all. Uh, it was a, a very realistic game of the social problems of the late Roman Republic. Um, so, you know, and featuring a lot of historical characters. Um, and, and the reason is that is I, I sort of wanted to write a series set in the late Roman Republic, but so many other people were doing it um, that, uh, that I felt it, it probably wasn't some place I wanted to go right then. Um, follow up. Have you considered publishing any of those games online? You think I'd make money that way? Uh, um, no, I just think it'd be an interesting experiment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, I didn't, I didn't invent the game system. I just used whatever game system yeah, sure, was handy. You know, you could publish yeah, campaigns. I could, I could certainly publish the campaigns. Uh, it would be a lot of work for very little return. Okay. Uh, so I, 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 and I, I do enough of that. So. Um, you know, I don't need a new way to lose money. Okay, I, and, and about the, the being a gamer and, and having that influence your work? Um, it's more the other way around. I think the work has influenced the gaming. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I wrote Hardwired, and then I did a game supplement based on Hardwired. So uh, I wrote Sea Stories, and then I did uh, a game set uh, based on Sea Stories. So it's, it's more in that direction. Um, very little of the actual game scenarios that I created with my players uh, were ever used in any kind of fiction at all, essentially because it's a different kind of storytelling. Sure. Um, and, uh, but uh, I did participate in the uh, Superworld game uh, that was run by George R.R. R. Martin uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, which turned into his wildcard series. Uh, and I've been uh, yeah, of which you've been a, a contributor. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kelly, any gaming experience you you you'd like to share? <laughs> are, are, are we continuing the trend though? Yeah. Um, uh, my only gaming experience. I am. I do play games, but those are usually video games because that is where I came in, and I am a being a former programmer. Yes. I was programming games back when I was younger. When you know, computers were much simpler and I continue to play them, the types of games that I play are usually not what people expect because if I say I play video games, people are like, you mean like iPad games? Uh -huh. That's not so, what I would have asked. No, I, I mean was like, thinking... Yeah, I mean like Bioshock, Borderlands, Skyrim. Those are the types of games that I play. 
So, yes. I, I would have asked, do you play Bioware games? But that's yes. because I'm a Bioware yes. gamer yes. first, and that's what I asked. Definitely. Um, and uh, so, yes, and I said that I, that I um, do middle, middle grade books. My, I uh, co-write those with a friend. And when we go into schools, she always finds some way of slipping in the fact that I play those types of video games because she says it's a surefire way to get the attention of like you know 11 12 13 year old boys and make me seem cooler than I actually am <laughs> um, video games Walter yeah yeah I, I played all of the games that Kelly Good. mentioned yeah uh, and think they're swell <laughs> I really I, I'm uh, really looking forward to Dragon Age 3 so, which I really Dragon Age Inquisition coming coming in November. Yeah. For your nerd. <laughs> That's yeah. I'm also really looking forward to that. Um, Kelly, you've said that uh, um, you you think of the worst thing that can happen to a character and then you do them to them. Uh, are there things you wouldn't do? Problematic if they're the main character. <laughs> not, not necessarily, not necessarily, because um, I do have a book in my other world series narrated by a dead character. She died in book two before we ever actually met her, but that doesn't mean in my world that you can't get your own book. She came back as a ghost slash um, angel. Anything I wouldn't do, I am. There are, okay, so if we're to get perfectly honest, I'm very careful with sexual assault. I just am. It's a trigger issue. So I have dealt with it with one character who was dealing with a childhood of abuse um, and had to work through that. But I was very careful how I handled that because I know that it can be for many women a trigger issue. And I think if it is to be handled, the problem is I don't know ever want to do it as the equivalent of a physical assault. It's, it's not like beating somebody up. Um, there is a very much, you can't, just, I've seen authors do that, where the woman suffers um, a rape, and then they treat it like a physical assault, and in the next book, she's perfectly fine. Can't do that. Yeah, the, the impetus for the question was uh, Sean McGuire saying, that uh, none of her characters will ever be sexually assaulted. Yes, that is, and I've the, that is the, the one thing that, that, that she said. That you can, if, if you're reading a Toby book, no, that is never gonna happen. Mm -hmm. so. I have had, I think, the threat of it once mm -hmm. because of that character, but never had it, because in order for me to have it, I would then have to spend books dealing with that. Sure. Walter, things you wouldn't do to your characters. Um. Well, I was just thinking, I did, I did in fact, uh, kill my main character in the first book of a series. <laughs> Planning ahead. Yeah, well, that was, uh, it, it, was, it was the historical series, and it was a multi-generational. Okay. So I, I killed the main character at the end of book one, and then I picked up the story with, oh, thank you, uh, with other members of his family. So I actually will kill the main character now and again. Um, or leave the character in a hopeless situation. Um, I, won't, I won't spoil it by telling you which characters I did that to. Um, but uh, I, can't, I can't think of anything that I absolutely wouldn't do. Uh, there, there are some things I would be reluctant to write about for fear that I'd get them wrong. And I think, you know, sexual assault is one of them. Um, but that would, that would be something I would have to handle very carefully uh, and with um, you know, due attention to, uh, to the, the uh, long-term results of that. Sure. Um, Walter, you've uh, worked on licensed uh, uh, stuff. You've done Star Wars. Um, how different is, is that from writing your own? Uh, in many ways, it's easier because you don't have to create the characters, they're already there. Um, yeah, I, I participated in something called the New Jedi Order, and mine was book 14 out of 19. Okay, and the, the, the main plot arc had already been created before I ever got there. Uh, so, so it's a little like writing for TV if you're not the showrunner. 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's very much that kind of collaborative experience. Uh, and, and I knew that going in, so I didn't have a problem with it. Uh, there were certain things that had to happen in my novel. Everything else was up to me. Mm -hmm. And how those things happened was pretty much up to me. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I had very tight deadlines, so I had to impose a great deal of discipline on myself uh, in order to meet that deadline. Um, and, uh, okay, if you, <laughs> if you write a Star Wars book for Lucasfilm, the first thing that happens is boxes of stuff start appearing on your doorstep. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. cool. You get the, the official guide to droids and the official guide to Star Wars planets and the <laughs> official guide to Star Wars warships and 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 all of this and and I mean boxes and the Star Wars Encyclopedia Volume Twenty Two. It's just all. Just, I, I'm hoping the, 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 not now just, it's just Star Wars Wiki. Encyclopedia, but the illustrated Star Wars Encyclopedia, which is a separate volume. And, uh, I'm really hoping now it's just a wiki available to, to, to Star Wars writers. Yes, yes, there are, there is now, but you have to know what to wiki. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's the Wikipedia, but I'm thinking of an official thing, just it's secret for writers. Yeah. Because they request the fans are doing a better job than their own minions ever did. So. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, the Wikipedia is amazing. Yeah, uh, but I, I, had, I had a great deal of fun, actually. I, I wasn't sure whether I would enjoy writing this book or not, and I really did, um, for all that it was a lot of work, mm. more work than I intended. But you know, if you're, you can't, you can't not enjoy writing on Solo. <laughs> you just can't. He's a great character. Yeah. Um, uh, although. Uh, although you did say you wanted to kill him. I did. Yes. I uh, okay. I did. I I didn't want to necessarily do it personally, but I did think that on Solo, if it, if it, if you the series was going to lose another major character. I thought Han Solo should be the one to die because he can't age. You know, everyone else can, can age and mature, but Han Solo cannot. <laughs> because he wouldn't be Han Solo if he did. Sure. And, and in my book, he was getting to be around 60. And, and so it's, it's a little hard to be the smart-ass rebel when you're that old. <laughs> Unless you're an elf. Yeah, unless, well. <laughs> smart, el smart ass rebel elves are not my department. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and some of the game projects I did were collaborative. Um, and, uh, and it's just, you know, if, if you've got collaborators who will work with you and talk with you when you need that to happen, I've. I've um, had, I've, I've been in uh, some situations where uh, the people that I was working for and with, you know, just weren't very responsive, and in that case, I just failed. I was fortunately in a position to do that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it can be great if you realize that you're not the one who's in charge and you're not the one who has the final say. Uh, it's, it is very much like writing for TV. Okay. Uh, Kelly, since you've also done licensed work, same question. My experience was very different. Uh, I did five uh, issues for Joss Whedon's Angel uh, when it went from the TV show into comics. So it was in that first year of comics. And I did not get boxes of stuff. I got carte blanche, basically. Um, and I, I think I found that a little bit intimidating because I expected that, that, that there would be some general path that I was that I would have to follow. And instead it was, no, here's where the one before you will leave off, now go. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think at the time that that was in a different publisher from, from Buffy, so it was yeah. it, yes, it, it was, was just it was going on its idea. own on its yeah. own path yeah. that was sort of not, not fully canon. And I couldn't use Buffy. And I had to be careful how I did use Spike because he was a character within both. Um, so but it, it really was, I said, you know, what are my limitations? And they're like, Joss says, have fun. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like I might have wanted a little bit more. I mean, it was nice to have that carte blanche, but I also felt like I was a little bit at sea. Uh, I mean, what I did was I went back and rewatched the in, the uh, entire series, um, just to, to because trying to get the, the your characters down, the voice down, and so on. But it really was a case of you have five issues. Here's where the one before you ends. Now do whatever you want 
for these five, uh, five uh, issues. So as much fun as that was, it was very intimidating for me here too. So, uh, so I don't know what's better, having the sort of where you're told to follow or, yeah. That is a good question. <laughs> And, 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 and one to ponder. Um, Kelly, you said uh, at, at the launch, and I already had that question, about, about the um, women of the, of the other worlds, uh, the name uh, hemming you in and, and causing you to write the, the novellas and in, for, in, for the male characters. Um, you, you published a lot of those online, right? Yes. So uh, I'm interested in, in hearing about, about publishing related materials online and how that experience has been. Uh, so um, after Bitten, I think when Bitten and Stolen both came out, and at that time I had quit my day job. I really had to because um, my daughter, our daughter was eight, and we also had two sons, both under the age of two. So this meant that with three kids, two young ones, full-time job and publishing contracts, something had to had to give. Can't be the kids, really. It wasn't going to be the you know, publishing contract, so it was the job. And that meant that I, I actually, once I got into the sort, of, the sort of routine, I ended up having more time than I expected. And, yeah, and, yeah, and you're Canadian, so you didn't need a job for healthcare. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, so then I, I, I said, well what, well, what can I do? And the obvious answer was write more stuff. But I, that, that wasn't at a point in my career where anybody was looking for me to write short stories or anything else. So it was, well, I will write online novellas, um, what I called e-serials, where I would put up a chapter twice a month. And I did that for years. Um, and they would be prequels to my other world series or short stories set in them. Um, so it was just, it was something sort of, it was really meant for the readers. It was kind of my way of saying thank you, here's something for free. What was really interesting to me was I was doing these for free and I kept getting readers a little bit, a little bit later, later on saying, when can I buy this? And I was like, free, online. But no, no, when can I buy it in a book? Um, so actually my publishers found out <laughs> and came to me and said, would you consider you know, letting us buy those for you? Well, and the problem then for me was that I'd written them as freebies. I'd written them as gifts for the readers, and it really felt wrong to pull them offline and put them in book form. However, readers had made it clear they want them in book form. So the solution was for me to, yes, I pulled them offline. Yes, I contracted to sell them. But all of the all of my proceeds from those two anthologies and all ongoing royalties from them go to World Literacy of Canada. So that was my solution. Very nice solution indeed. <laughs> uh, and uh, now we will reach the point where where I have decided to embarrass our writers by by making them ask each other a question. Uh, who starts? Ah, uh, let's start with you since you asked. <laughs> um, Kelly, you have dealt with various mythologies in your work, uh, and, and and you continue to explore more um, outside of, of what you might think of as the typical uh, range of urban fantasy. So, um, why are you doing that? Is it fun? And which is your favorite? Yeah, I am a huge myth and and folklore geek. I have no idea why, I can only remember. I was very, very young as a child when I memorized where in the Dewey Decimal System you found the myth and folklore reference books. And I read every book in those. And just that was what really fueled my uh, imagination. So for what I consider, so I sort of divide myth and folklore. So for what I consider folklore, my favorite type is the most obvious one for me, it's werewolves. Mm -hmm. um, and this was for somebody who grew up as an animal lover, wanted to become a veterinarian until I, as a teen, spent, um, a, spent some months working at a vet and realized I'm, I actually get sick at the smell of blood, can't become a vet. 
Uh, so combining animals and folklore, the obvious one then for me is werewolves. Continue to be my favorite, my favorite folklore to work with. For mythology, uh, again, love all different different types. I'm in my new stuff. I'm exploring Welsh, which is something new for me, and that's been a lot of fun. Overall favorite though is the one that Melissa and I picked for our middle grade, which is Norse. I'm a big fan of Thor and the Loki, and it was funny because we sold. That those uh, books just before the Thor movie came out, <laughs> so we were like, "Please do well, please do well." And my youngest said, "It's great that they're making a Thor movie, Mom, because now kids will actually know who Thor and Loki are." So, so it was good. aliens, superpowered aliens. <laughs> yeah, I, I I grew up in a kind of uh, Norse influenced area in northern Minnesota. And so uh, Norse mythology was something that I just kind of acquired uh, because you couldn't avoid it. Uh, but the best part of the Norse sagas is that half of them are history and half of them are, are fantasy and mythology. Um, and, they, and they blend together in really interesting ways. Uh, it is. It, it, it is just some really fun myth and reading the poetic edda, the prose edda, com comparing and contrasting the different tradi traditions. And when I said I was doing middle grade Norse, a lot of people said, how do you adapt Norse myth for kids? Because there's some weird stuff in there. <laughs> so instead, we just put in references that only adults will get, like, you know, Loki, father or you know being the mother of um, Od of um, Odin's horse and we don't explain how that actually works <laughs> I, 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 was it ever explained I, oh yes okay, that was well, explained right. obviously that wasn't in my kids library either so yeah, okay. um, follow up question on Welsh mythology how are you dealing with those names oh it's not actually Okay, geek moment. One of the fascinating. <laughs> I geek moment at Icon. Oh no! <laughs> one, of the, one, of the, one of the really fascinating things with Welsh, with Welsh. There we go. Get up really close. Um, is that yes, those words are. They look like they're impossible to pronounce, but actually, once you know how to pronounce all the various diphthongs and you know vowels and so on. It's always the same, unlike English, where it depends within it. You know, do you pronounce it long e, short e? There's none of that. I mean, it really is. Once you know how to pronounce all of your diphthongs and all of your you know pairs and all of your your consonants, you can pronounce anything in Welsh. But then you still have to know that s i d h e is pronounced she. Yeah. Which is B E A N S I B H E. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dawin is pronounced Dune. Yes. That's the Welsh. Yes, and it's like a, yes, yes, because Hounds of the, of the Other World or the Wild Hunt, which I deal with, is Kuninun, which is C W N A N N W N. Kuninun. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> the pronouncing is not the problem. It's the, 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 the spelling. It's the spelling. Yes. Yeah, so I need to memorize English. Them. Yeah, and, and, and when one translates stuff like that, you're you're you have a huge dilemma, which is, am I going to translate transliterate it as it's written, or as it's pronounced? Because yes. people who are familiar with myth from reading about them in English. Would have no idea in many cases if I if I translated it as it's pronounced. And you do we need to have a guide. Of bricks in there, like saying banshee and spelling it properly, but then having a character comment, mm -hmm. you know, that that's not how they would have thought it was it was actually spelled. And saying that, that would help the translator. The way that the way that we spell banshee, which is B-A-N-S-C-H-E, um, and we're then doing it again the other. Yes. Okay, Kelly. Now your question for Walter. <laughs> okay. So I was talking about how I wanted to become a, a vet. Stage magician? I heard you were a stage magician. I, I was. I was That's a stage way cool. magician. Um, <laughs> actually, I was working on a series about a stage magician, and I decided to actually do it. <laughs> 
So I, I, I research. Mean, yeah, seriously. Yeah. So I actually did performances as a stage magician. I, I had an act, and uh, and I had had done it at science fiction conventions also. Um, I would saw editors in half. <laughs> Every writer is one of them. <laughs> but I would I would deliberately ask editors. I I I saw it, and and I did this with a, an electric saw, not with a human power saw. I did it with a saber saw, black and decker saber saw, which I did not tell the editors that I was going to use. <laughs> but I can, so I you know I I I would. Say, Someone once, needs to buy your books. That's once I, why. Once I once I had them lying on the table and so I, I didn't put them in a box either. I saw them and have right in front of everybody. <laughs> okay, but um, okay then. I would say I, I would like to introduce my assistants for this trick, Mr. Black and Mr. Decker. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that people would give me the most interested look <laughs> because the blade on that thing was oh, about that. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, uh, well, that part was a lot of fun. Um, Did anyone say, I will never publish you after this? <laughs> uh, well, not, actually, I was smart enough that none of them were, you know, my editors at any point. Um, one of them uh, said that she survived because she wrote Stet on her abdomen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a copy editing joke. I'm sorry. It's, you know, that's, uh, it's, it basically means... She, that doesn't change. Leave as is. Yeah, right. Yeah, this is, yeah stet, stet is Latin for leave it stand, let it stand, something like that. So, um, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm totally out of practice now, but I'm still fascinated by magic. Can we have an idea? Can the audience ask questions? We're coming to that. We're coming to that real soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. You know, I, I, I read every uh, a lot of stuff that's available on, on magic and, uh, uh, and and whatever fiction I can find that has magic as a basis and uh, find it very fascinating. Do you have a trick you can do for us right now? No. <laughs> that's what I thought. But you know, it's worth a shot. I'm sorry. I, I was never a good enough magician to actually do a spontaneous trick like that. I, I require apparatus <laughs> and a certain amount of... You, you don't do close magic. Uh, I did at one mm. point, but no, I, I can't do it anymore because I'm just totally... You know, the hands just aren't, aren't in practice. I, I, I stopped because I realized I did not have the obsessive nature of the true stage magician. Once I started meeting other actual magicians, I realized how inadequate my own attitude towards it was. I, what, what, I, I didn't practice for eight hours a day for the last six years. Oh, I'm supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, also, it was kind of they, they, there are a couple. There are several tricks, names for the kinds of tricks that you can do, and and you can do. Um, and, and one of them is self-working, which is basically where you have an apparatus that does the trick for you. It's just. And then you take credit for it. But the thing is, that was always, those were always the ones that blew the audience's mind. You know, I, I'd be employing this cheap gimmick, and they go, ah. Well, the and people then I, who and built then those I, And then I'd for months to do some little close-up magic trick. And I'd get polite applause. Yeah, and yeah, it just didn't seem fair. The people who build those apparatus, apparatuses are amazing. Yeah, 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 they are. And now we go to audience questions. It's just requested that magically a second ago, I do not even a plant. <laughs> yes, you can ask the first question. Hi, Walter, from a quick uh, a Google search on you that I did, I, I gathered that you have started the science fiction writing um, program or something? Yes. Yeah, we, we, dis we discussed this yesterday, but... You, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, I missed well, it. <laughs> but I, I was certainly my talk about it again. yesterday, and unfortunately my GPS completely got... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't make it. Yeah. So uh, my, I have like uh, very quick questions on that. Like, if you had a, uh, like, um, I, I would like to just to get a sense of how that has, that experience has been. And if you have like a wish list of the kind of students you'd like to have in that workshop, what would that be like? Would you would like? Would you uh, would you want to have a mix between like a scientist, somebody in, in, in mythology, like somebody who comes from a background of like I, 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 Okay, or? I have I have I have no okay, prejudices okay, about the sort of thing well, that I don't want. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, I'm. 
I'm open to just about any kind of fiction as long as you know there, there's a certain degree of confidence and imagination going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, it's it's not entirely my taste in in who we accept because I work uh, with Nancy Kress, who is a terrific teacher and a terrific writer. Uh, and and so we, we sort of have to agree on who we're going to invite and who we're not going to invite. But what makes a better student? Would it be uh, somebody who comes from a creative writing background, filmmaking background, science, um, mythology? What would, would you like? I, I, any of the above person? sound terrific. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Any, yeah, any of those. Are, are you any of those? Are you, are you <laughs> all of them? Well, you know, it would be great to be all of these yeah. things in one, but I'm just like wondering, like... like we had a rock star one here. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, but... Like, <laughs> Who? Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't come, but it was uh, Jackie Fox from The Runaways, the bass player. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> but who does, who, what, I mean, what kind of people does your program typically uh, draw? Is it more people who, from science who want to become writers, or writers who want to do science fiction? Or is it filmmakers who just want to know how to... Uh, well, I, I think, I think, I think a good way... It's not aimed at filmmakers. Yeah, I, I think a good the way... Want to write well, science fiction. A good way to answer that in, in a way that will make sense for, to everyone is to explain a little bit about Tao's Toolbox and, and what it is that you work on. Okay. Uh, Tao's Toolbox, it, it runs for two weeks every summer in Taos, New Mexico, which is a beautiful mountaintop community at about um, 3,300 meters altitude. Uh, and we are in the middle of a beautiful national forest. Uh, and mountains, and it's wonderfully inspirational, and we are up there by ourselves for two weeks uh, with nobody interrupting us. Nancy and I each do a lecture every day. Uh, we critique the students' work. You, uh, if you were there, you would get to submit two large pieces plus uh, uh, some homework that we assigned during the course of the workshop. Um, next year, we're going to have uh, Carrie Vaughn as a special guest speaker. Um, we're going to have Emily Von Tippetts, who uh, knows a, a lot about self-publishing, because that's becoming a much more important part of it. Um, in the first six years, uh, the graduates got six Hugo nominations. <laughs> Good so start. I think, I think we're actually doing pretty well with this, uh, and and you know every year we, we get people. Um, we had one uh, one student who went home and looked at all of the stories that had been rejected and rewrote them all and so promptly sold them because she was she was able at you know just just after a, a couple weeks of doing this to diagnose what was wrong with the front story and fix it. Uh, I didn't do that. She did that. Um, so uh, that's how that works. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion and a lot of fun and hikes in the forest and uh, forced marches over 11,000 foot mountain passes to kill an elk with your bare hands and <laughs> drag it back to the barbecue, sort of. Uh, I, I think we're going to move on to the next yeah. questioner. Thank you. No, I, actually, there is a web page, taustoolbox.com. Look, at, look, at, look there. Okay. okay. Please speak up and, and when answer. When you write a book for teenagers, and you have to describe a very hard scene, for an example, a rape or something, uh, how, how do you write it in a way that teenagers could uh, read it without, uh, you know, scaring them or whatever? <laughs> without permanently damaging them? <laughs> I tend to actually worry about that less with teens than with adults. I mean, teens now, I would not deal with rape unless that was the point of that book, and that was what I was getting at with that book. Um, because, again, especially for teens, for teens I am careful with certain things. Uh, for example, the, uh, my latest YA, the setting is, is based on Japan's Sea of Trees. Japan's Sea of Trees is the second highest suicide spot. In my book, this is not going to be a suicide spot because this is a book for teens and the point of the book is not suicide. Therefore, I would not casually bring that up. 
Um, instead, it's where this uh, empire exiles their convicts. So it's doing something, something different. There are certain things that I would not touch on unless my point was to deal with it as subject matter. That's just, that's just a little something when dealing with teens. You wouldn't randomly have a teen have um, an eating disorder and completely gloss over it. It has to be dealt with if it's in there. Uh, so for things then like dark scenes, violent scenes, uh, the book I was just mentioning, I have decapitations, disembowelments. I mean, it's based on medieval Japan. So there are some very sharp swords in there. So decapitations, disembowelments, I massacre an entire village. Um, it's, dark, it's darker than a lot of my adult stuff. Teens have no problem with that. They really don't. Now, I'm not going to overdo the gore. I'm just not because, honestly, um, I'm just, I, I, I don't shy away from it, but I won't overdo it because this is not a full-on horror novel. There are horror elements. It's not a full-on horror novel. So I'm aware of that, but I'm never really thinking, um, you know, I'm going to tone down the gore because it's for teens. I'm thinking I'm going to tone down the gore because my target audience is not horror readers per se. I'm same as I would in an adult novel. I wouldn't overdo the gore because that's not my target audience unless I was writing a full-on horror novel. So I'm not with teens worrying. I mean, now with middle grade, it's different because those are younger. But teens, uh, you're talking uh, young people who have, for the most part, reached their adult reading comprehension levels. Um, so that part isn't really a problem. They're also, they're dealing with some dark stuff. There was an online movement a couple of years back because somebody wrote an article on why are all these teen novels so dark and violent? Like dealing with things like, there are novels that deal with things like eating disorders and cutting. And then you've got like the Hunger Games and these are dark, dark things our kids need. Happier stuff. And the, <laughs> Yes, yeah, you can just imagine how, t how actual teens and YA writers responded to that article. Best quote I heard was an author, and I do not remember who, who said it, but she said, uh, teen novels are, have those dark elements because the lives of teenagers are not all about rainbows shitting skittles. <laughs> <laughs> Being a teen is terrible. Yeah, um, um, we've we've got uh, a half an hour, <laughs> so that, that, that's like a question that, that can be answered either really quickly or at great length. Uh, so let's go to the quickly. Quickly is do it. I mean, research as much as possible. Everything from reading books to finding to finding experts who can speak to you. Don't shy away from it. Um, it is learning. It is one of my favorite parts of this job is getting to research katanas, uh, you know, Japanese history, um, Welsh mythology. These are really my favorite parts. I get to buy books in Japanese um, that have lots of pictures and then have a friend who speaks Japanese help me decipher what they actually mean. I mean, that is to me the best part. So don't shy away from it, embrace it. Um, that really, it really can be. So, so you're putting in research in your books that are things that you're interested in yourself. Uh, yeah, I, I obsessively research and, and what Kelly said. Uh, you know, I, I, I try and look through the literature. Uh, I read stuff online. I try and find books. Uh, if I can, I will try and find an expert to explain stuff to me. Uh, what I find. Um, my problems aren't, aren't with the stuff that I don't know, because I can look that up. My problems are all, always turn out to be with the stuff that I think I know, but I don't. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not about to give any examples of that either. <laughs> you either find it or you won't. Yeah, I, I, I'll mention my favorite anecdote about research, uh, which is that when Guy Gabriel Kay wrote a book setting that uh, parallel Tuscany, he lived in Tuscany for a couple of years. When he wrote a book set in a parallel Provence, he lived in Provence for a couple of years. When he wrote a book set in Turkey, he discovered the wonders of online research. <laughs> I, I point out that 
I, when I set a book in Turkey, I went to Turkey. <laughs> Turkey was pretty awesome. <laughs> I, I actually also enjoyed, enjoyed Turkey myself as, as a visitor, but uh, yeah. yeah. Greg Egan went to fucking US. <laughs> He's hardcore. Yeah. Does that you have a question? Uh, yeah, um, Billy didn't ask the obvious follow-up to uh, the uh, league. I'm so, so, so ashamed. What sort of GM is JRRM? Uh, someone who played his uh, Super World, and is he the killer of the enemy? He cheats. <laughs> How often does he kill player characters? <laughs> uh, he prefers trapping them in horrible dilemmas uh, in which there is no way out. Um, no, what, what, what we discovered after a while was that you know we would. Uh, was that all of our all of our plans were thwarted, and that's because we were planning in front of George. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and so when we when we actually tried to figure out what we were doing, we actually had to go into a separate room and lock George out. <laughs> and then we could occasionally surprise him. Um, over there, right next to you. Hi. The question is for both of them, and it's about uh, passing the fads. So I will, what? Uh, passing the fads. Ah, oh, fads. Uh, cyberpunk was big in the 90s when it went down. Uh, today, a uh, young adult uh, ur ur urban uh, fantasy is big and can tell how long it's going to last. So what do you think about those kind of that go away. Well, yeah, that is, that is a problem, and I, that, that was part of my objection back in the 80s when cyberpunk became fashionable, because I knew that what could become fashionable could very quickly become unfashionable. Um, and, and so but the, the only solution I could think of was just to do the best stuff I could, and, and hope that, uh, that that effort and that quality was visible to the audience. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, and, the, the, and, and another problem is that if something becomes trendy, then, then editors start buying a lot of it. And, the stuff, and a lot of the stuff that they buy isn't as good as the stuff that inspired the trend in the first place. Um, you know, there were a lot of really bad cyberpunk novels that appeared in the early 90s, and they're all forgotten now. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah. translated one of two one or two of those. Yeah. So um, uh, anyway, I seem to be missing all the all the all the latest fashionable trends. So. Uh, so, so we'll go to Kelly, who's who's. who's <laughs> I've gotten in doing quite well on track. I've, I've gotten in luck just by pure luck, honestly. On a sort of like like you know, not the ground floor, but the first floor of a couple of very big fads. One being urban, urban, urban fantasy. Um, when Bitten came out in two thousand and one, they there was no subgenre. Well, urban fantasy referred to something different. Um, it was not what we call today those very typical stories set in a contemporary world with supernatural creatures. Yeah, um, it, it, was, it, was more about, it was more about fairies exactly. in, 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 the, in the 80s. Exactly. Um, so then urban, urban fantasy became big, and I, I was not on the ground level, but on like the first step. I came out the same year as Charlene's first book and the year after Jim Butcher's. So it's really good timing. We all knew that once the publisher started buying those up like crazy, and like talking to their current, especially romance authors, and saying, can you add some some werewolves, vampires, etc., to your books? That 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 subgenre was going to be in trouble. And certainly, yes, it then becomes bloated. The quality then, um, and readers get discouraged with it, and we can see it start going down. So as soon as I was ready to end my series, I ended my series, and I started doing something. I would say sidestepping to something somewhat different. YA, same thing. YA, though, was an even bigger boom and bust um, in the paranormal uh, fiction because they really bought them up like 
crazy. HarperCollins, which is my YA publisher, in one year uh, debuted um, 30 new YA authors, almost all of whom were doing paranormal type of YA fiction. So basically, you, you just killed it. Um, you just had so much out there that readers got glutted and tired of it very fast. So I actually was contracted to do a third trilogy. I, they had paid me to do a third trilogy in that same series. And I said to them, I said, I A, don't have any good ideas, and B, I see that the market, I think, is going to start crashing pretty quickly. What I want to do instead is this high fantasy horror crossover, and I expected them to laugh at me or at least ask for their money back. They said, no, that's fine. Um, a follow up, uh, what do you think is going to be the next? <laughs> be, uh, I think if I knew that, I'd be writing it. <laughs> yeah. And you don't really want to be writing it because whatever is currently going to be hot, you know, by the time you would get something out there, it would already have been hot for a while. Yeah, I mean, right now it looks like it's space opera. Uh, that's it's on a on a, a strong rise, but that might not be it. Um, you know what you talked about about with, with paranormal is is funny because the original uh, um, urban fantasy boom uh, came immediately after the horror bust of the early '80s, when a lot of people when people stopped buying those those books, and a lot of people who were working on horror toned the scary down, thus creating. Urban fantasy. And it really is. When you hear what's been, what will be the next hot thing, please don't chase it if you are a writer. Um, I just, I really don't believe that you will be behind the ball on it. I have so many young you know, writers saying to me, dystopian's hot, right? And I'm like, the, the publishers have so much no, dystopian is there. YA. Uh, right now, every YA publisher is looking for the next John Green. There is no next John Green. He's in his own category. Yeah. But that's what they'll say they're looking for. Yes. Uh, please find somebody who's already incredibly popular as an online figure and, and uh, has his own brand and wrote a really heartwarming story that's touching and moving. Uh, well, actually, he wrote more than one. I mean, we all know yeah. Paul Bean on Stars, but he wrote the last guy. He wrote that. Yeah, but, but this was the one that hit. Yeah. And also his 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 uh, online presence was at that past that tipping point, and 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 they don't exist in boxes you can pull pull, pull them out of. Uh, from time. Uh, yeah, we, as as an editor and and running as a publisher, if we had those boxes, we would use them. If it's, if it's any good, I always hope it will influence my writing. Um, you, you mentioned Zelazny and, and, yeah, and so Chip Delaney as influences. Zelazny, those aren't bad to have. I, well, I still read them. You know, I go back and read those books. Uh, they're terrific. Um, I have a lot of really talented friends. Um, so I read a lot of their books. Uh, and, and I try to keep up with some new people. I mean, uh, uh, Anne Leckie, I think, is terrific. Her debut novel, and I'm looking forward to reading the second one. Um, Daniel Abraham, I think, is just amazingly good. Uh, James S. A. Corey, who was also Daniel Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> who half of half of whom is Daniel Abraham? There's 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 a new writer called Ian Tregillis, who was my student at one point, uh, and his. He's got four, four or five books out, uh, including a, a, a trilogy set in a kind of alternate World War II, uh, which features British warlocks against uh, Nazi supermen, uh, Nazi superhero, superheroes or supervillains, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't get into that. Ah. Uh, Intergill is one of those writers who I think at some point he will write a book that, that hits me and then I love it, because I can see he's really talented, but but it, it doesn't work for me yet. I, I had the exact same thing with Kat Valenti years ago, and, and now I love her, I love her current work, so. Kelly, <clears throat> who do you read for fun? So I read all, I, I read, I'm omnivore. I read lots of different um, genres. 
Uh, what's sitting in my bag right now that I'm waiting to pick up is Code Name Verity, which is historical YA that everybody has said is great. I haven't started it yet, but do I by ever whom? worry? By whom? Oh, great. See, you know, as an author, I should know the author names better than uh, the book titles, right? Yeah, so totally blank. Code Name Verity. Um, um, am I ever worried about things influencing me? Oh, yes. And that means that I am pretty careful to not read what I'm currently writing because I really, really do worry that I'm going, that some of uh, either the author's style or something that they have in it will leach into mine. I personally feel like I'm a little bit of a sponge and I can accidentally pick up things, and, and that does worry me. Um, I have so many questions, I only have time for one. Pick um, one, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's so Elizabeth I'm, Ween for oh, Codename Verity. Thank you. Okay, um, Sorry, Elizabeth. Uh -huh. uh, television. Um, recently, Bitten was made into a TV series. Renewed for a second season. Yes, so I'm looking. Um, but sometimes I like the TV goes off in a totally different tangent than this book. I mean, was watching it and enjoying it a great deal until they killed off a character that wasn't supposed to kill yes. off. Yes, no details or names. No, not the same. Um, and that ha also happened to another Canadian writer, uh, Tanya Ha. Her Bloodline series it completely went weird. Um, how, I mean, but I felt like you had your hand on the pulse of the series at the point. <laughs> no, I have nothing to do with the TV show. So if it stuck to the books to a certain point, that was the writers choosing to stick to the books to a certain point. Um, I, they have made it very clear that they don't intend to stick to the books, and the sooner they can get away from the books, the better. Uh, yeah, and this is typically how it works with TV. Now, Game of Thrones is an exception, but it really is an exception that far more often um, they kind of stick to the first book for the first, and we've seen it with True Blood, we've seen it with Dexter, we've so often, they kind of stick to book one, and it's basically to pick up that readership, right? They want to give you some experience similar to it, and I, I think, you know, they are writers too, so I guess they then want to start telling your own story set within that world. So yes, I do know that season two will be somewhat close to stolen, um, mainly because a lot of my readers showed up for the TV show and wanted them to do stolen. But it, so it will be very, very loosely based on stolen now, which was not their intention. Okay. Yeah, but but you know, this, despite the, the the series being picked up, um, your books are a lot more well received than the series was, I'd say. Um, uh, gently, so so that that might have an influence on on their decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You. Uh, I'd like to ask about the editing process. I mean, when you finish your first draft, you give it to the editor. What happens uh, after that stage? Does he tell you, okay, change this, change that, or does he or she change that? What kind of crazy person would give an editor a first draft? <laughs> Someone under a very strict deadline. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a very good answer. Usually, <laughs> my editors, they would never, nobody honestly sees my first draft. Not even my daughter. I mean, nobody sees my first draft. First draft it, it, it is crap. Um, so, nobody sees that. Um, they may see the second draft depending on if, it, if I'm established in that series, I usually will let them see the second draft. If it's something fairly new, um, I will then still do a, a third draft before they actually see it. Third draft, yes. Um, and then they send the edit letter, which includes some major points and minor points. It is, I swear to God, mine are always 10 pages. It must be by like, co by like contract. Um, they're always about 10 pages exactly. Um, it just means that as I've gotten hopefully a little better at catching my own problems, they just get deeper into things. But they send the edit letter and I sulk for 24 hours. Because I read it and I'm like, what, what, no, what? 
Um, and then after 24 hours, I go, oh yeah, they're right. Yeah, they're right about that too, and that too. Maybe not that, but everything else they're totally right. No, um, they do not actually edit anything. They do not go in and touch anything. Uh, they don't, no, no. <laughs> it, is, it is always giving you the suggestions and it is your choice to change this or don't change this. If I go back to them and say I disagree on a certain point, because I, I do like to run my disagreements past them, my editor always says it's your storytelling. Um, right, yeah, the, the uh, I've been edited less and less uh, as the years go on. I don't know if it's because I just turn in perfect novels or uh, whether the editors just don't bother doing that anymore. Uh, but I get I get very few suggestions. But they are suggestions. Um, yeah, very often they are very good suggestions. Uh, and I hit myself in the head and, and say to myself, why didn't I think of that? Um, and then go out and make the, make the changes. But, but anyway, yes, you do. You do have the, the freedom to reject an editor's suggestions, uh, at least on a novel. Um, you know, if you if you sell a short story to a magazine, uh, you know they may reject it if you don't give them the story that they actually want. I suppose I've never had that happen to me. But I have known it to happen. Um, um, I will say that if you're interested in in this in the Israeli market, a lot of the edit letter, that would be uh, several meetings over coffee. Because Israel's way smaller, yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot easier to physically get to the people. Um, and then you have to talk about it and analyze it. Yes, yes, and, and, and then, uh, um, as I may have heard from editors, uh, something about authors draining their soul <laughs> while, while trying to get away from making changes. I, I, that, that sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, uh, Yes, uh, people more argument to person, it's terrible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, why did you decide to set the Darkest Tower trilogy abroad in the United States? Mm. Oh, uh, so the, for the Dark Powers, I was back and forth on whether to set it in Toronto or Buffalo. I, I really hadn't decided, but I've used Toronto before. And the first book, at least, there was no real city setting to it. It took place mainly in a group home. So it didn't matter where it was set. So I decided to show Buffalo some love. Because really, nobody shows Buffalo. And, you know, um, I live three hours from Buffalo, and there's kind of a reason for that. But it's not a common setting for books. So I hear from a lot of Buffalo and upstate New York people who are so happy to actually see their uh, city in a, in a, in a book. Um, Toronto gets a lot. So it was Buffalo's turn. It's always reminded of the, the X-Men quote in this, the Smoking Man uh, uh, episode. That Buffalo can get to the Super Bowl, but they must never win. Darkness Rising, her love of animals, love of nature. 
is mine. New series Canesville, Olivia, main character there, likes mochas and fast cars. That's totally me. <laughs> Everything else about them though isn't. I always just pick a few things that are me in pretty much every character. When I actually did, I, early on, you know, readers did those like, what, which other world character are you? And they do these you know, online quizzes, and I would secretly take these quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> and they always came back to saying I was clay. That's scary. Uh, that is scary. Yeah, that is scary. My psychopath werewolf, apparently, the one that I'm closest to. Not true, really. Uh, uh, you know, of course, the, the worst result of an online quiz is Joe Hill took one, and he told him he's Stephen King. <laughs> Being a brave man, he put that on his Tumblr. If anyone doesn't know, Joe Hill is Stephen King's son. Um, characters who are you and not you. And yeah, I don't, I don't really think I've ever written any characters that were me. Um, in part because I don't consider myself very interesting. Um, you know, and I have exactly the wrong background to be a hero in a novel. Uh, you know, I, I had a happy childhood. So that disqualifies That's me from being a terrible. fictional character it's at all. It's almost much. bad background to being an author. Well, yeah, yeah that's, that's a handicap, too. Um, and I don't know anyone who sees me in the characters particularly. They, they, uh, there are certain relationships that echo. Um, and so uh, some people have noticed, uh, noticed that. I, I never did. Um, uh, the character of Lincoln in Deep State. Uh, reviewers said that was clearly me, and that my paternal relationship with the female protagonist uh, was sort of my relationship with my own character, and I didn't think that was at all true, but it certainly seems plausible. <laughs> uh, and, and who am I to judge, really? Uh, it sounds like a thing. Yeah, uh, I write about characters that I'm interested in and, uh, and, and that I want to find out more about. And I sort of already know enough about me that I'm not interested in finding out anymore, I suppose. So, uh, uh, so you know, I, I, I invent my characters, make them all up out of nothing. So I'm, I'm, I'm a godlike being whose characters <laughs> do exactly what I tell them to. <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that, a uh, thing you have uh, over over your your old GM George, whose characters <laughs> run the hell away from him. That's all they should. Um, we got time for two more questions. Hey Walter, yeah. uh, two part. Uh, uh, can you tell me about the process of writing wild cards, the collaborative in one universe, <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, about the Chaos Two books? Uh, how do I sign up? I saw this. Just, just I'll, I'll answer the second one briefly. There's a website. Yeah, Google it. Yeah. Well, you know, yes. Uh, 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 yeah. I, I don't, I don't act personally care if you send a uh, electronic manuscript or or a physical manuscript, but uh, but my partner does. Nancy wants to read an actual manuscript because she will copy edit it as she goes and then give you a copy edited manuscript when you come to the workshop. And you really want that, because she's a very, very good copy editor. I'm lousy at that, so I don't do it. But she will line edit your manuscript. Cool. Um, so, so there you go. Uh, but yes, you, you send a manuscript to us, uh, one to each of us, along with a, 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 a token but significant sum. Uh, <laughs> you actually mean all of this. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and then you wait to hear from us. And the applications will begin on December 1st. Okay, and wild cards. Uh, okay. Um, George, uh, unfortunately, George went to Hollywood about the time that, that he started doing uh, wild cards. And so he came up with the Hollywood idea of the pitch session. And uh, um, you, you never sell anything in Hollywood because you're a good writer. Uh, you sell some stuff in Hollywood because you can do a good pitch, which means you go in and you meet a row of producers who stare at you with no expression. <laughs> and then you verbally pitch them your story idea. And, and they may respond or they may not. Yeah, 
and that is a craft in and of itself. And it is, it is a humiliating and miserable experience. Uh, and so George loved it. Uh, <laughs> as long as he got to be the producer. So, um, so basically, we, fortunately, we don't have to pitch face to face, uh, which might actually be more fun, actually. We, we, have, to, we have to actually sell our stories um, to him in the form of an outline for the story that we would like to write. And then he'll tell you what your story really is about and has been about all along, <laughs> and and how it fits in with all the other stories. And it's all jigsawed together in a in a process that I find kind of incomprehensible, and that uh, that I often don't actually want to. <laughs> uh, well, but I'm glad I don't have to do myself. Okay. So it's, 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 it's a long, complicated process that changes as it goes. Uh, and in fact, it, and it changes after you start the writing, and it changes after you finish the writing, and then you have to go back and do more writing. Um, and uh, there, there was one story that was particularly uh, diabolical. It was, it was the last of the Jumpers series. And by the time, and, and it was sort of, you know, and, and, and George was saying, well, okay, but your character is in this scene and it's a really good scene, but I'm going to take that scene away from your character and give it to this other person's character because that person needs a moment right then. Uh, and, and basically, by the end of all of that procedure, my character had no reason for being there. My character was just kind of an observer that didn't do anything important for the entire book. That kind of but, sounds like what, what happens to Hollywood script. Yes, yes, exactly. Which character was in the role playing game? Uh, Modular Man was was one of my characters in the role playing game, and uh, Black Shadow, another one. One last question, or none? Okay. <laughs> I suppose it's mostly for uh, Kelly. What is the difference uh, in uh, your mindset when you approach uh, writing adult or young adult or middle grade uh, novels? You already said the darkness, for example, is not necessarily a factor. Yeah, uh, so really it comes down to the age of the characters. And this sounds simplistic, but it is. It's saying if I'm going to write a YA novel, I need to be, to be coming up with a plot that is going to be correct for the teenage characters, what can they do? What things are they going through in their lives? Whether they are in a fantasy world at 16 or a contemporary world at 16, what is the 16-year-old teen facing? And that all deals into it. So it's issues of identity often, issues of fitting in versus wanting to fit in versus wanting to stand out. Um, you know, and of course, YA Roman or young young adult is often sort of you know put down for the romance. But let's face it, that's the that is the age when you often discover your first romance, and it has a big impact. Um, so things like that. If that's all in there, that's a YA novel. Adult novels vary because. A 22-year-old character that I that I do is different than a 30-year-old character is, is different than a 40-year-old character. What stage of life are they at, and what things are they dealing with? Middle grade, same same thing. Middle grade, you're not usually dealing with romance. You're dealing with the primary relationships in at that age are going to be friends and family. So you're dealing with the conflicts within friends and within family as a say 12 year old begins to separate from the family and stand a bit more on their own. So that's why you often see in middle grade, parents, something horrible happens to parents. And or the kid has to leave the parents in some way, Harry Potter, you go off to boarding school, um, or the parents are killed or something happens because you, you are taking that normal process of separating from your parents and exaggerating it for that for, for that audience. I just had a thought. Gotham should be a, a middle grade series. <laughs> 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 that, that might work better than what we have now. Um, really quick follow-up. Can, can you write 
Cause, cause, cause that, that, that's a woman in coat. That's a sign of you need to go. In this current market, it would still be called a young adult book because there's a good young adult market. Yeah. Um, so we often say that uh, if the character is within uh, between the ages of 15 and 18, you are going to, to be writing a YA whether you think you are or not. They will market it as young adult, but also market it as crossover for adults. Same as in middle grade, also doing extremely well. You're, you're still looking at you know Harry Potter, also looking at Rick, Rick, Rick Riordan's work and so on. So if your protagonist is that age, your core market will be considered middle grade. And with that, I, I would like to thank our guests one final time for being wonderful. I'd like to thank you guys for coming to our panels. Thank you.